A warm welcome to this video. And uh, Asim Malhotra, Dr. Asim Malhotra, is joining us from the States. Asim, welcome. Hi, John. Nice to see you again. It's been a, it's been a little while. It has, but we, we did meet briefly at the film premiere. What film and what premiere, Asim? Yeah, so this is a documentary film that um, myself and my co-producer and director, Donal O'Neill, have been working on for um, about a year and a half. It's called First Do No Farm. And it really reflects, I would say, more than a decade of my work and advocacy, doing a deep dive into big food, big pharma, understanding how they uh, have really corrupted and damaged medicine, uh, people's health, and, and sort of layer by layer, in a way, unpicking how that has happened and why it's happened, and then and giving people solutions. So there's quite a lot to chew on, and I know obviously you've seen it yourself, John. So uh, the aim of the film, again, is just another medium to change hearts and minds mm -hmm. and really uh, fight back against our, this current tyrannical, if you like, system that we're, we're living under. Yeah, we just feel a little bit like pawns or ping pong balls bobbing around on the surface of something that we don't really have much control over and the, the, the film really does as you say it, it unpicks that it looks at how these things are happening why these things are happening it does so in a great deal of detail almost two hours the film and uh, if you haven't seen it do get it there's a link at the bottom to download it for seven dollars which is is remarkably generous you're gonna have to watch it a couple of times to get all the details out of it well maybe half a dozen times to get all the details out of it but it's professionally made, uh, entertaining, but, but thoroughly informative. How on earth did you manage to get the Odin in Leicester Square, where the premiere of the James Bond films are seen for the, for the premiere? I was well impressed. Well, I think Big Pharma, actually, I'll come on to that in a second. I think there was some stuff behind the scenes. I think they tried to stop it even airing, uh, the Odin. But in terms of also, John, uh, you know, we, we put our, a lot of our time and effort into this uh, we put our own money into this. So this isn't, you know, for the purpose of making money, obviously we wanted to at least break even and, and get people, you know, to download at a very reasonable price to watch it. So that helps us. I think okay. um, one of the issues as well, unfortunately, is there is a, a massive amount of shadow banning going on, mm. even to the extent where, you know, some big name celebrity figures that were there, the likes of Holly Candy, Anthea Turner, Jenny Powell, um, you know, Annabelle Croft, all these people they're not able to share it on social media. So, for example, if they're sharing posts just being at the movie event at the Odeon, if, if, if it's being shared, people, it's being taken down by Facebook saying it breaches community guidelines. I mean, it's absolutely shocking, but in some ways a backhanded compliment because, as you know, you know Meta unfortunately has commercial interests linked to Big Pharma. I got told that by one of, the, one of their senior executives um, last year. Uh, that if uh, any content actually conflicts with some of their, you know, corporate partners or sponsors, then there's a good chance it'll get shadow banned or taken down. And people don't know this. You know, this is this is absolutely the opposite of what should be a, a society built on free speech. But coming back to the Odeon, yeah, we we decided that we were gonna, you know, I wanted to, we wanted to make a statement. We wanted to give back to the people who had been part of this movement for so long and supported it. So, you know, we organized it you know, to take place at the Odeon. It was approved by the Odeon team. Um, of course, they had to see the film finally as well, just to prove that they were okay with it. Yeah. And of course, as you've seen, you know, it's not a, it's not a film that is, you know, when people watch it, there's nothing to do with conspiracy theories here. It's just cold, hard facts told by some of the most Absolutely. eminent experts in their fields. But those cold, hard facts paint a really, really disturbing picture. So good on the Odeon, to be honest, John. Yeah, absolutely. And obviously we filled it out with whatever, 700 people plus. And yeah, uh, yeah. It, was a nice, it was just a nice event to bring people together as well, wasn't it? Mm. And of course, oh, opened and introduced by the leading film, female film director of the UK, Gurinder Chadha, who's famous mm. for films like Bend It Like Beckham, Blinded by the Light. Uh, so I'm more than anything else, John, for me, it was about putting something together that was high quality, mm. first and foremost. And of course, the rest is then to disseminate it to as many people as possible. Yeah, and, and if you start watching it, do block out two hours of your life because it really is quite compelling. Well, once you start watching it, you're just waiting for the next, uh, the next point to come up. And, I mean, if you had to just summarise the reason why you made this film, is, is it a sense of injustice, a sense of uh, anti-scientific rhetoric? You know, what, 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 yeah. what is it? What's the main thing? I mean, for me, one of the main things is, is the... The reason that we're kind of where we are as a society is because of science. You know, we believe in empiricism. We believe in 
uh, debate. We believe in someone presenting a, a hypothesis and someone arguing about it. And we believe you can have like a dialectic progression of science. I think that's the main thing that I really object to, that we're not free to debate these issues. Quite happy to have my ideas knocked down. That, that's fine. Sure. But let's be free to debate them. I think that was my main thing, just absolute irritation at the system at the moment and the way that research is, is paid for selectively. So many great ideas that you've got in health. I, I only know a fraction of them, but, you know, talking to other doctors around the world, so many things we could be doing, but we're, we're sort of railroaded into this pharmacological straitjacket. Sometimes, of course, drugs are wonderful and, and life-saving. Yeah. Other times that there's alternatives which could be considered first. It's, you know, lifestyle factors. I mean, what, what was your main motivation, do you think, Asim? Yeah, I mean, John, to be honest, I am obsessively passionate about my job as a cardiologist to improve patient outcomes and help the system and fix the NHS. That's something I've been very passionate about going back probably 15 or 20 years. So for me, it was about a root cause analysis about what's going wrong. Why have we got this pandemic of chronic disease? Why is it getting worse? Why have we got a stalling in life expectancy in the UK since 2010? And actually more people with chronic disease now, which basically means we're getting sicker. Why have we got two to three years um, knocked off the life expectancy in the United States? Yeah. Uh, and that was before the pandemic, you know, and, and this is very American centric as well. So uh, the, it really, for me, that was my... Um, sort of motivation to really get to the roots of it and realize when I did that over over a decade, uh, primarily coming at, coming at it from a perspective as a cardiologist trying to understand why have we not curbed heart disease? Have we got it right on cholesterol? Are statins as effective as we, as we think they are? And then really just trying to think of a way to, once I understood what was going on, which essentially is the fact that, you know, medical knowledge is under commercial control, but most doctors don't know that is to how do we unpick it and then how do we communicate it in a way that then resonates with people, with the public, with doctors, with policymakers, that creates that shift that we need so we ultimately can improve patient outcomes. That's what we're here for. That's, that's all I care about, to be honest, is how do I improve patient outcomes? What does that mean in simple terms from evidence-based medicine? Um, it means managing risks, it means treating illness, and it means relieving suffering. And on the point of treating illness, you know, Joseph Freeman, data scientist mm. you know very well, who's in the film, um, he yeah. makes a very, very good point. He says, we're not here to throw the baby out of the bathwater. You know, he's an ER doctor, an A&E doctor, right? And actually some of the best things we do in medicine, probably the best bang for your buck is actually in emergency care. Mm. He says, medicine and healthcare should be there primarily to, te to treat the sick. And yeah. that's what we do well. The chronic disease management should be almost all predominantly lifestyle focused, uh, you know, uh, primarily, and that's not happening. And the drug industry are now in a situation where their business model, which is fraudulent, you know, deliberate deception in order to make money, is also based upon the fact that they want to get as many people taking as many drugs for as long as possible. Mm. And this isn't a conspiracy theory. This is exactly, it makes sense to them how they make money. And I debated the CEO of AstraZeneca in 2019 in the Cambridge University Union. And the motion that they put forward then is we need more new drugs, which in effect said, we need more people taking more drugs. And only recently, John, we've seen a new stories, I think the Mail Online reported on it, that scientists were suggesting that we need to give 15 year old kids statins to slash heart attacks. Yeah. So the whole system is going in the wrong direction when it comes to actually looking after people's health. It's self-destructive. You know, most of what the drug industry produced now are copies of old drugs, so there's so much waste. They produce a lot of drugs where they're more harmful than beneficial. We've got no access to real independent evaluation of the data. And all of this is revealed in the film and including, you know, you mentioned a really good point early on um, about the damage that's done to society. Kim Witsack, who is a, um, the consumer representative, of the FDA in America who's in the film, gives a very powerful testimony about her, how her husband, who was very well, had a bit of stress, was put on antidepressant and committed suicide. And later on, it was found out that the drug company had withheld the data that that's one of the potential side effects. And she mm -hmm. says, we have now just become for the drug industry collateral damage, John. Mm -hmm. Collateral damage. I mean, you know, we try and have this, a rational conversation about it, but we can understand why people would get very, very shocked and angry when they realize what's going on. But we need that to change the system. 
Absolutely. I mean, so many people with obesity who would like not to be obese, so many people with uh, high blood pressure and strokes and heart failure and all these complications that would like not, not to have those those things. So we're not saying that drugs aren't necessary, but we are saying that lifestyle is fundamentally important. And I know this ties in with your work on, on nutrition, Asim. You've done a lot of advocacy work, very high profile advocacy work on things like reducing sugar, reducing carbohydrates, reducing ultra processed foods. Do you see there's a commonality in the problem of what you might say ultra processed foods just being thrown at us with no alternative and, and drugs being thrown at us with, with no alternatives? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the, you know, what's very interesting is when I started my act, uh, advocacy on obesity, one of the first topics I picked up on was looking mm. at the evidence around sugar. And when you look at the sugar industry, you know, or the food industry, there, there's a great paper written by uh, a psychology professor previously at Yale called Kelly Brownell. And it's called How Big Tobacco Played Dirty and Millions Died. How Similar is Big Food? And a lot of what the food industry took on in terms of their corporate tactics um, was very similar or mirrored or influenced by big tobacco. So what does that mean? Well, ideally, from their point of view, you want people to keep eating more food and they want to make huge profits from that. One of the mechanisms for that is actually is actually manufacturing food products, right, that are hyper palatable, yeah. um, are cheap with a high profit margin, cheap ingredients, but also potentially addictive. Yeah. And if you get people addicted, addiction is the opposite of free will. But they're so yeah. pathologically self-interested, mm -hmm. um, John, that I also uncovered. And this was a myth that was pre prevalent for decades actually perpetuated by the food industry for obvious reasons is they made people believe and some people still believe this that the primary reason that we are getting overweight is because we're not doing enough activity mm -hmm. and that PR campaign came from the food industry to, to distract from their unhealthful food products that were getting people addicted and actually when it comes to health and listen you're talking to a guy that is I would say probably obsessive in terms of his discipline about exercise I'm you know I'm away uh, from home I'm on holiday or vacation I will still find a gym because that's what I, I think is good for me in my mental health, my physical health. But when you look at the data on obesity specifically, exercise has very little effect. In fact, you know, the likes of Coca-Cola and McDonald's also then pushed out a PR campaign using scientists to then say it's, you can be fat and fit. So even if you're overweight or obese, as long as you're exercising, you're actually and it's absolute and total nonsense. Yeah, yeah. It's good for people to exercise for health. But, you know, when it comes to weight, it's almost all diet. And also in context for health, John, the, the Lancet Global Burden of Disease Reports a few years ago actually did an analysis. Simon Capewell, who's a um, professor of public health in the University of Liverpool, his own analysis of that basically revealed that globally now, poor diet is responsible for more disease and death than physical inactivity, smoking and alcohol combined. So the low hanging mm. fruit, the most important thing for a lot of my patients, and we explain that in the film as well, there's a lot on the big food issue, is actually to fix the food. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, my, my figure that I normally would say is, is in terms of obesity, about 90% of how you're gonna lose weight is diet. Does that sound about right? Yeah, that's fair, absolutely. I mean, yeah. I would say maybe 100, but yeah, that's fine. 90, 90 is reasonable. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we could argue about the last 10%. Well, well it's yeah. interesting on that, I tell you, Tim Noakes, who is um, yeah. uh, you South know, African, the sports yeah. scientist, mm. he's one of the most cited medical researchers in the world. Um, he's the one that actually, you know, pr he admitted that he got it wrong about carb loading for marathon running, for example. Right, he changed his diet mm. and he got he got slimmer, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm. He says it's a great line: if you have to exercise to lose weight or keep your weight down, your diet is wrong. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Now we don't want people to think that we're going uh, anti-drug. We're not. We're not. At least, at least, I'm sure in my mind, I'm not. You know, when I haven't worked for. a two, three years now. But when you do, I was giving drugs out all day, every day in, in an emergency department. And I'm sure yeah. you still prescribe drugs. Absolutely. We have, we have, we have this idea of an, an indication. A drug is indicated in a particular situation normally, but not always, but normally when someone is ill. Do you think the indications have been broadened out too much and we need to be more specific giving a particular drug for a particular indication for a particular period of time? Absolutely, 100%. So again, You've got to understand, you know, Carl Hennigan, who I'm very friendly with, who's a director of Center of Evidence-Based Medicine at Oxford, as you know, 
Um, he looked at my peer-reviewed paper before it was published on the vaccine issue, and he he okayed it, right? Um, very smart man, very high integrity. He, can, he uses a very good line. He says, for every intervention you do as a doctor, you've got to ask yourself two questions. How much difference does it make? Yeah. And how do I know this? Yeah. When you look at the expansion of the use of drugs for chronic disease, again, there is a clear incentive from the drug industry to lower the thresholds for what is considered suddenly a risk for disease, etc., and therefore get people on pills. If you take the example of high blood pressure, for example, yeah. John, um, again, most people don't know this. So a, what's considered a mildly raised blood pressure is if you've got a blood pressure above 140 over 90, either of those two figures, systolic or diastolic figures being high, right? That's considered a mildly high raised blood pressure. And then when you get to 160 over 100 and above that, it's moderately raised. Yeah. Now, most people, at least 50% of the people in this country and even America are on medications for mildly raised blood pressure. Now... Is mildly raised blood pressure a risk for stroke and heart attack? Yes, okay? And, and the higher it goes, the more there's a risk. There's no doubt yeah. about that. Yeah. The question that people don't ask themselves is if we lower it with a drug, does it actually make any difference? And the only way you can prove that is through a randomized controlled trial. Yeah. When you look at the evidence, this is a Cochrane review going back to 2012, yeah. there is no benefit in preventing heart attack, strokes, or death in treating mildly raised blood pressure in people who are moderate risk. They haven't got lots of other things going on like type 2 diabetes or, you know, uh, morbidly obese or whatever, or smokers, right? But most people are in that category and they're not, they're not even told that, John. Now, mm. that is a problem because one, you're giving them the illusion of protection and two, because of the illusion of protection, they're not doing anything else that actually is going to probably yeah. improve their outcomes through lifestyle. And mm. people may ask, well, hold on, Dr. Montreux, how is that the case? You've got a risk factor that's identified. If you lower it, is it automatically going to improve outcomes? Medicine isn't an exact science. It doesn't work that way. We're complex, complex systems. And what's likely an explanation, which I've come up with, is the root cause of high blood pressure, or at least responsible for at least 50% of high blood pressure, is insulin resistance. Mm. Chronically raised insulin causes heart disease. There's a direct mechanism of how it damages the inner lining of the arteries and probably leads to stroke. So what's happened is you're lowering just one aspect of something associated with risk, but you're not tackling the insulin resistance and therefore people are, are going to still have the same worse outcomes. This is the level of, that we need to be having discussions in clinical medicine and in research to actually improve patient, patient outcomes. But instead, it's, we've dumbed it down. Mm -hmm. The drug industry now are even in a situation where they don't even need randomized controlled trials to get stuff approved. They're just taking a biomarker associated with disease mm -hmm. and saying, oh, we've changed the biomarker. That's it. And people presume yeah. it's going to do some good. And then yeah. by the time later on someone does a trial, they've already moved on to the next drug. They've made loads of money. They've hidden the <laughs> yeah. side effects and everybody's worse off as a result of it. This is really an absolute, I mean, it's, it's bad science. It's bad medicine. Um, and it's our duty and responsibility, John, as people who are you know, coming from a place of integrity and really care about patients and are independent of industry interests to call this out and help change the system. So it's almost as if moderately raised high blood pressure it could, could be it could be a biomarker it could be being caused by the, this fundamental possibly metabolic imbalance yeah and rather than the the moderately raised blood pressure that's actually causing the pathology leading to yes. the heart failure leading to the atherosclerosis it's actually the metabolic disturbance and, and the moderately raised blood pressure should be seen more of a symptom and when you see the symptom you should think yeah. boy just a minute just a minute what's causing this symptom and, I, and absolutely, and I, I, listen, I implement this in my practice. It's been a, yeah. a journey for me in, of learning as well. Yeah. Looking at the evidence that's there, trying to figure out does it make sense, implementing it with my patients with fully informed consent. And the, the results I've had are extraordinary. I mean, it's very normal for me now to manage patients, and they are shocked within, a week, within weeks of my lifestyle recommendations, and it's tailored for them individually. Yeah. They come off their blood pressure pills, they get their type 2 diabetes into remission, and they, and they feel better. I wrote about this in 2012 about the mildly raised blood pressure stuff in The Observer in a front page commentary when I talked about a pediatrician, a consultant pediatrician who came to see me at the NHS and was on this pill and she was getting side effects and she only had mildly raised blood pressure. Mm. And once I explained this to her, <clears throat> sorry, and she was a doctor, she, you know, she got better, she lost weight, came off the pill. But I was writing about this in 2012. We got the, the Choosing Wisely campaign, which yeah. I was instig you know, instigated where I got a... Um, a um, a coalition, if you like, between the British Medical Journal and the Medical Royal Colleges, who I was an ambassador for. Um, and, you know, we launched this, wrote a paper in the BMJ, hit the news, and basically about changing practice of medicine. 
But a few years later, on our second hit, when I talked about statins, again, co-authored with one of the chairs of the previous chair of the medical colleges, and this comes out in the film, it's not a big spoiler for you here, but essentially behind the scenes, almost certainly Big Pharma got involved and they convinced the new chair that um, I, uh, you know, suggested I had my own agenda and that they should really get rid of me. You know, and I was absolutely gutted, John, 2018 mm. that was. I got that email. I'd worked with them for seven years. I'd been a lead person in their obesity strategy and their too much medicine strategy, you know, working with the establishment to change the system from within as well. And uh, it just is a marker of what they do. So one of the things that comes out in the film also is the challenges that we all yeah. face. But you just got to keep going because, you know, a life lived in darkness has no meaning. Um, people uh, who've done much greater things and much harsher things throughout history have dealt with much worse. And actually, as, and this is where we also in our own personal growth, John, in our ability to withstand all these attacks, we have to we get to a position where, you know, we have to do this almost from a position where we transcend ego. And it's not easy yeah. um, where we have to be greater than what we suffer and think, actually, it doesn't matter. We're not here to be thanked. We're not here that six months later, someone they're not going to come back and say, John Campbell, you know what? You were absolutely right about that COVID vaccine. Rosie Mahotra, thank God, you know, you spoke out when you did. And, and I'm so sorry. We're not going to get that. And it doesn't matter. We don't need apologies from people. We just want no. people to get better. We want to change the system. Yeah, That's absolutely. human nature. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah I, I, absolutely. I mean, the, the the idea that you were talking about just before there, the, the, the biomarker and the symptomatic treatment, which we focus so much on. I often use the analogy of a splinter. If you have a nasty wooden splinter in your finger, I could give you 10 milligrams of intravenous morphine. I could give you a local anaesthetic in your finger and you wouldn't care about your splinter and you wouldn't be able to feel your splinter. Alternatively, I could simply pull it out and... You know, we need to be getting to the fundamental causes of these things, not yes. looking at the symptoms, not looking at the biomarkers, not being overly clever about it, just going to the basic things of what a healthy human lifestyle is. Absolutely couldn't agree more with that. Now, we're not political on this channel, but you went to an interesting event last night, Asim, I believe. Yes, I was invited at the uh, Rescue the Republic rally that took place in Washington, D.C., organized by Brett Weinstein, um, and it actually had a lot of, you know, big sort of public figure, um, truth seeking, you know, warriors out there from like. Oh, drop drop a few names, I seen. Drop a few names. Uh, Robert Kennedy Jr., <laughs> Russell Brand, um, yeah. Jordan Peterson. Yeah. You know, yeah. Someone who I followed for a while and yeah. uh, I find very inspirational. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we met and he said he wants me on his podcast. I'm very excited about that. Um, you know, for me, also during just very briefly, you know, I've had a lot, as we all do, we've gone, you know, we, we suffering is part of life, but I've had a particularly difficult time in the last few years losing both my parents and then getting medical persecution. And, and actually his advocacy and his teachings and what he talks about actually gave me, you know, the way he articulates it actually gave me a lot of um, extra strength, if you like. So it was good to meet him. And uh, yeah, it was basically just a, a rally to essentially say that, you know, we need to fight back against the censorship industrial complex that's taking place. It was political, of course. It was, you know, it was uh, indirectly, if you like, telling people that they shouldn't support, uh, they shouldn't vote for the current Democratic Party because they have been the biggest perpetrators and the biggest yeah. colluders yeah. with these corporate interests in censorship. And, uh, and it was there really to try and, uh, you know, galvanize people, say that this, this the next election in the US is happening in a few weeks. They need to, the only person that can really fight this and is anti-war as well, clearly from his track record, is Donald Trump. Now, I never thought I would be saying that. No. I come from, I'll be very open and honest with you, um, uh, John. I come from a tr traditional left. I'm very passionate about the NHS. I'm very passionate about public health system because it's human right, but also because the evidence Absolutely. suggests when it's properly run, you get higher quality Absolutely. at lower cost. That's another discussion. Yep. But actually in this space, uh, I think, you know, it's definitely, definitely a, a better alternative. It looks that way at the moment than it does um, what's going on right now. But yeah, it was getting people together. It was discussing these big issues. There was music there. Um, you know, there was tens of thousands of people that joined. There was, you know, Be Del Bigtree, who is the... Um, uh, you know, the, the, the face of the high wire in the United States, you know, he was also part of the organizing committee. And he said later on in a VIP event, which was moderated by Russell Brand, that had Tulsi Gabbard, it had uh, Ro um, Robert Kennedy and Jordan Peterson. He said that half a million people tuned in to watch wow. this run. I was invited <laughs> there to go up on stage and I was kind of humbled. I wasn't expecting that to basically be recognized with a, a bunch of other doctors, including Robert Malone and Pierre Corey 
as yeah. being you know one of the doctors that was on the front line fighting speaking yeah. truth to power so that was quite nice to walk out on stage and have all these people sort of cheering um but <laughs> again daunting but yeah yeah but you know right. again again john I, i've got to a stage now where i just i see myself as a just a, a, a medium for a message and the sum yeah. of my influences and a, a lot of those influences were there so for me that yeah. was uh, it was just a beautiful moment We'll have to see if they're going to uh, free us up with a few video clips that we could show of that. That would be uh, Yeah, tremendous. well, I've actually asked them today. I told them I was chatting to you, so we'll, I'll try and get you some clips. Oh, that'd well. be wonderful, yeah. Yeah, we don't want to leave out the people that... Well, where was this? Was this is this in Boston or Washington? Washington, D.C. Washington, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, Washington, D.C. Yeah, yeah the, I mean, the, those of us on the other side of the pond and the opposite side of the United States would love to see that. That would be, that, that'd be brilliant. Right. It's all very well complaining and identifying... Given unlimited power, you're now in charge. You and RFK are put in charge. Yeah. <laughs> which, which I would like to see, to tell you the truth. But well, what, what practical steps can we do? What do we do to fix this? I think the first thing In the to ideal say, world. Yeah, okay. So what John Abramson is also in the film, who's um, a Harvard doctor, who's written a brilliant book, by the way, called Sickening, How Big Pharma Broke American Healthcare. Mm. He says, unless we correct commercial distortions of the scientific evidence... Yeah, we will not fix the healthcare system. That so is a good first, phrase: commercial distortion of the scientific evidence. That's... Absolutely. So the key thing, John, I would say is first and foremost, the low-hanging fruit, which everybody can get behind, is that the drug industry can develop drugs. Yeah. But given their track record of all the fraud they've committed and the millions yeah. of people they've killed, that's testimony yeah. from Peter Wilmsus in the film. Millions, yeah. literally, from yeah. hiding data on harms. Yeah. They should no longer be allowed to test them themselves mm. and, in de and and they need to be independently evaluated yeah. by by scientists who have the, the rigor to do these sorts of analyses yeah. and designs yeah. of studies who are not connected to industry. Very straightforward, low-hanging fruit. Yeah. And we Number have many two. such many such people can do this. Yeah. We are, Absolutely. Yeah. And then we can get a greater truth of the true benefits and harms of these meds. And then yeah. they need to be communicated to patients in the right way. So that's yeah. a big pharma thing. One more thing, the regulators... Yeah. You know, 50 to 65% of the funding of the FDA comes from Big Pharma. 86% yeah. so of the funding in the MHRA in this yeah. country comes from Big Pharma. That needs to be dissolved. They have to be independent. So they cannot yeah. be funded by the very industries that they are supposed to be regulating. That, that's a no-brainer. Yeah. Then I think the other side of it, John, as well, is um, when it comes to the food system, we need to create food systems that actually are providing people with food that is actually going to be good for them mm. and nutritious and are not mm. going to get them addicted and not going to make them fat and yeah. sick. Yeah. And one of the, again, the low hanging fruits we can have at the moment is, and we can apply the lessons to how we beat tobacco is actually eliminate, if you like, or minimize the consumption of ultra processed foods, which is yeah. more than 50% of the calories in the British diet. I yeah. think it's more than 60% of the calories in the American yeah. diet. And that would be a, and a good public health campaign yeah. to basically educate people to eat real food. Mm -hmm. In 2012, I, um, one of the ca other campaigns I launched where I got Steven Gerrard at, th at that time, the England football captain, and Jamie Oliver yeah. to co-sign a letter that I drafted that hit BBC News saying that we need compulsory food education and cooking skills brought into school. Yeah. You know, we need to create a culture that is conducive to good health. And I think the food, focusing on the food, would actually go a long way to improving the nation's health, individual health. And, the, and, and from my own experience, John, as well, which is, which is also the, the bit of hope and the good news, mm. the dietary change is actually very rapid in terms of improving people's health within yeah. weeks. So I think on a population level, if you've got politicians in or policymakers that listen, this is our priority, i.e. Robert Kennedy Jr., we could transform the health of, the na of nations around the world within a very short space of time, within a few years, within one electoral term. I mean, some damage has already been done. You know, people with strokes aren't going to recover. But, you know, we could prevent people from having strokes, prevent the heart disease, prevent the diabetes, prevent the hypertension. Um, we, we can get benefits to health really quite dramatically. And not only will people be healthier, they'll feel a lot better. You know, when you lose some weight, you go out and do some exercise. You just, yeah. you, you hold, you hold, the whole person becomes, becomes massively improved. And this could be done on a huge scale, as you say, in a relatively short period of time. Absolutely. And again, John, you've, hit some, uh, you, you've um brought up another issue here as well that the most common chronic disease at the moment is actually mental health problems depression yeah, and anxiety yeah, yeah so this actually the dietary stuff i worked as yeah. a um on the as an honorary council member for the metabolic psychiatry unit at stanford mm. and we did some studies and i was a, a co-authored an abstract paper showing that the dietary changes for people with severe mental illness 
actually massively improve their, uh, and even people with sort of depression, improve their depression scores when they went on low carb or ketogenic diets. So there's an element there for sure, mental health, physical health improves mental health, improving mental health improves physical health. Um, you mentioned about prevention. What's really fascinating is there is a lot of new research as well that the so-called preventative measures actually can also be curative in the sense that we can get people on blood pressure pills. My personal interest, which is I want to push further and we need more research in, is actually the reversal of blockages of heart disease. And there is something, I'm not going to give a spoil and give too much away, but we do go into that a little bit. Is, is this possible? Mm -hmm. And if it's possible, how is it possible? And that for me is the next uh, frontier yeah. in shifting the paradigm of managing heart disease, Re yeah. actual reversal of the blockages. We've got, all these, we've got all these clogged up arteries, this atherosclerosis, and how can we get rid of that to get patent arteries again, to get the, Absolutely. To get the blood supply going? I mean, I think the mental health thing is so important. You know, there's so many nutrients that we take in massive excess that yes. are really bad for us. But there's also nutrients that we're not getting enough of. So we think of vitamin D, we think of magnesium, we think of zinc. Often those last two, actually, because the soils are depleted, because we've been putting nitrogen fertilizers on all these time and all the, the natural things, the magnesium, zinc and selenium are being exhausted from the soil. Um, iodine, simple things that we can do, uh, dietary fiber, gut microbiomes, simple things that we can do because they make the body better. And we have this thing called the gut brain axis that we can actually feel better overall. And I, I'm well up for that because, <laughs> you know, I think we all have a anxiety problems and depression problems and yeah to, to and, and varying it, degrees and, and and absolutely john and some of it also is, is a lot of it is actually culture which is again this yeah. corporatized system uh, you know yeah. the root of, of, of how we live and how we think yeah. and how the media creates certain things social media works to get us to buy products that are not going to give us true sustained authentic happiness if you like yeah. you know that also needs to shift as well you know we've got yes. this culture where people are you know more worried about image and status and wealth than they are about personal growth, about their relationships with others, about giving back to the community. And it isn't just a, a perspective or ideology. In fact, all the evidence shows is that there's a psychologist called Tim Cass has done work on this. Mm -hmm. And basically all the evidence shows that the more what materialistic one is mm -hmm. in reference to what I made, those points I made earlier, the less happy you are, the more anxiety and more depression. So yeah. everything's going the wrong direction because of this, corporatization of human beings and this culture yep. we're in. So part of the solution, again, is to go back to understanding what does it actually mean to be human? And actually, yeah. that's something that beautifully got articulated yesterday by Jordan yeah. Peterson, Russell Brand, RFK Jr. in the Rescue the Rally, uh, Rescue the Republic Rally. Um, and that is, again, absolutely fundamental to, you know, progressing yeah. society and humanity in the right direction. Yep. And I don't mean to be self-righteous or egotistical, but actually being completely truthful, I am never happier than when I'm helping other people. Yeah, it's, it's, it's what we're here for. <laughs> you know, it's just... Uh, yeah, 100%. Uh, it's, it's, uh, now, you've used the term uh, psychopathic to describe some entities. What do you mean by that term? Yeah, so, so again, some of my influences, uh, the two people that um, alerted me or got me thinking about this term was actually the forensic psychologist Robert Hare, who was behind the original DSM uh, classification of psychopath. Yeah. This is um, a diagnostic a, and statistical manual for mental absolutely. health. Absolutely, and he's a, he's a forensic psychologist. Mm. Uh, this was then picked up by law professor Joel Bacan, who wrote a, a brilliant book about 20 years ago, and then in a more recent one called The Corporation and the New Corporation. And when he looks at big corporations, including Big Pharma, on the way that they operate in terms of making money, he said they fulfill all the criteria for psychopaths yeah. as, as entities, not as individuals. In, in, I, think, I, I, yeah, yeah. I think the system yeah. make, encourages good people to do bad things. But the, the legal document, the piece of paper called the corporation, fulfills that criteria. So callous disregard for the safety of others, incapacity to experience guilt, yeah. deceitfulness, repeated lying and conning others for profit. And he, and he said there's a new definition which has been brought in more recently in the new corporation, which is actually using excessive charm uh, mm. as well, which is actually what yeah. you see with these big yeah. corporations. So they, yeah. they go to this, they, they try and come across as benevolent, but it's just to mask the fact that their true intentions are pathologically self-interested. So yeah. that's where, I, so I came up with this term called, you know, we, we have, there's something called the commercial determinants of health in public health, which means, mm. which is defined as strategies and approaches adopted by the private sector to make products and choices that are detrimental to health. So in other words, 
uh, a way that the industry deliberately harms you for the purposes yeah. of money, right? Yeah. I've yeah. taken it further and I call it the psychopathic determinants of health at the root yeah. of the problem. And everything that happens downstream that affects us is a result of that, even at a, at a, at a less um, pathological level is just corporatization or materialism, you know, yeah. of human beings. And actually, interestingly, Richard Horton, the editor-in-chief of The Lancet, mm. he came to one of my lectures a couple of years ago and he wrote it up, actually my lecture and coming to this lecture and what I was talking about, and he actually referenced it in there. So I, I can I now, I, I now have the, uh, I can be whatever named as the person that came up with that term, the psychopathic determinants of health. Yeah, <laughs> Well, we won't call it Mulhotra syndrome, but it's, uh, it's at least you've got the reference in the Lancet. I mean, to me, the, the key thing about psychopathy to me, and I have worked with a few quite nasty psychopaths, actually, is that people are things. They have no intrinsic value as human beings. They're just p things to be manipulated. And, 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 and if you crush a few of them, then that, that doesn't really matter as long as it gets to get gets to your particular aim and uh they are frightening people to meet we, we stress individuals involved in this are, are not psychopaths it's the way that the corporate entities emerge it's almost like an emergent behavior yes and the, the, the other thing that really gets on my nerves is is, is self-righteousness <laughs> um you know we, we're, we're helping human beings we're helping humanity well well sometimes actually you're just helping yourself which is uh you Absolutely. know we, we, we need more honest and honesty and transparency Absolutely brilliant. What, what, what's planned for the next uh, the next few days, I see? Are you coming back yeah, to so, Blighty? So, Donna, I'm a bit on, on a bit of a tour of the US. I'm here till early November, at least. Oh, wow. Um, mm. Trying to do lots of different podcasts. As you know, Joe Rogan, when we announced the film initially on his podcast a year ago, he said he was going to promote it. So hopefully I'll meet Joe in a couple of weeks in Austin. Fantastic. Um, you know, uh, I know it's a, a movie that will be of interest to lots of people. Senator Ron Johnson, I know you've already featured him. Yep. Love the film. Everybody in America that's seeing it, so far, doctors, yeah. policymakers, they're blown away with it. Uh, we haven't, we had overwhelmingly positive comments, but it, it's a kind of call to action. People are seeing and think, ah, the penny drops, and they're like, okay, we need to do something about it. I think the challenge we have, of course, John, as you already, as you already know, is that because of the censorship industrial complex, big pharma yeah. Yeah. and big food will do everything they can to stop people seeing it. But you can't, you know, the, the truth is like a lion. You don't have to defend it. You let it loose and it'll defend itself. We need to just through a ripple effect, even behind the scenes, people shouldn't get disheartened if they can't share it with people or posts. Just everybody themselves just keep pushing and we will break this, we will burst this bubble. And I met yeah. Zuby yesterday. I don't know if you know Zuby. He's a rapper and he's a, a public figure and a speaker. Um, he's interviewed Elon Musk. You know, I've sent it to Zuby as well. And, and hopefully we can get this Elon Musk. You know, the more influencers that see it, uh, the greater likelihood we have of bursting this corporate tyrannical bubble, yeah. if you like. So yeah. Uh, yeah. the plan is just to, yeah, next few weeks to just get, go around America, do podcasts, hopefully get some mainstream uh, engagement and uh, get as many people watching it as possible. Absolutely. When you see Joe Rogan, I can probably squeeze him in probably November <laughs> if, he, if he asks nicely. <laughs> So you can download this film. Um, yeah, d d download it. Get a couple of mates round. You know, get 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 in some get in some health food. Get make, make some green tea. A couple of beers if you have to. And uh, you know, watch it as small groups. You know, I really enjoyed watching yeah. it with with other with other like minded people and uh, or, or people that aren't like minded. You know, no, all sure. are welcome. You know, do, do do it in little groups. Do it in the village hall. You know, do it in the local pub. You know, yeah. ju ju just, just, you know, this is something that affects us all. You know, you don't realise how valuable it is to be healthy until you lose your health. You don't realise how good it is to have normal mental health till you feel anxious. You don't realise how good it is to feel normal till you're in pain. And, you know, we need to stop taking this for granted and start really improving the health of the planet. And we yeah. have the knowledge to do so. And we have things that are wrong that can be fixed and we can replace those with things that actually work based on evidence-based medicine, and we can go forward in, into a, a scientific future where we're actually allowed to work out more and more things to help people, which is where we want to go. Absolutely, John. Yeah. 100%. For, for now, Asim, as always, thank you for what you're doing, and thank you for coming on this, uh, this brief program. Thank you. You, you too. Thanks. You too.